We're back again. Mm -hmm. All right, there's some madness going on in the UK right now with the cost of living. And there's one video that I'm going to react to. So I've got about four or five videos that I'm going to react to. But there's one video in particular. I don't even know what order it comes in. I think it's, well, anyway, stay tuned to the end. Anyway. But anyway, there's a woman, apparently all women, because I ain't watched this video yet, who are basically putting themselves out there on the street and selling their body because the cost of living is nuts. So <laughs> let's get into it, fam. Should be interesting. And we get uh, quite a lot of slugs, so every morning you'd see little slug trails. Yeah, let me show you the kitchen. So haley has been renting this home for five years, but has faced an uphill battle to get problems in it sorted. This is after cleaning it regularly. You can still see that the staining from the black mould. And this is where you keep your food, yeah. store your groceries. Yeah. I try and keep everything enclosed. I couldn't keep any fresh food oh. in because it would just go mouldy and go rank. But for many private renters like her, raising issues with landlords comes with a fear of increasing rents or having their tenancy ended. So this is the shower. Um, we, me and my partner, have not been allowed to use this shower, despite the fact it works. We haven't been able to use it for... How the fuck do you shower in there? Do you shower like this? Like, fucking hell, man. Like, this phone box is bigger than that. Shit, blood. It's mad. 11 months and what we've discovered is that it's leaking in various different places you've been washing in this then every yeah. day for the last 11 months i would fill it up about three inches we can't afford in a cost of living crisis and an energy crisis to be running a bath every time we need to wash oh what a bad last year, side Hayley was told her rent was due to increase by over 25 percent uh does it shut Shortly after that, she was served a Section 21 notice, a so-called no-fault eviction, giving her eight weeks to leave. It was... Let me pay attention to that notice. Shut. Shortly after that, she was served a Section 21 notice, a so-called no-fault eviction, giving her... Oh, so Section 21. Okay, all right. I mean, <laughs> my, my, my notice that I give my tenants is a Section J wise, but yeah, okay. Now I know the official terms. Eight weeks to leave. It was just such a blow because we'd already been, it was 10, it was like nine, 10 months into, you know, the sh not having a shower and the house was, de was deteriorating in quality quite rapidly. As we were going into winter, the house prices and renting prices in Bristol have just gone, like they're just too, way too high. And then when he handed us the section 21, he kind of, he saw it coming almost. Like, he'd have to do so much work on the house that we'd have to leave at some point for him mm -hmm. to do it. But it was like super devastating because we had made this our home. We contacted the government who told us they're committed to increasing rent. See, that's the problem. That's why I don't want to let out my entire property to a family because with HMOs or, you know, room shares and that, when people go into there, they know this is temporary accommodation. Now, it might drag on for three years and that, but they know they got it in their head, oh, this is temporary accommodation. One day, I'm not going to be living here. But when a family takes on a house, even if they're keeping up with their rent or not, it doesn't matter really, but yeah, let's just assume they're keeping up with their rent. They believe it's their house. So when it comes time to evict them, through, was it the section 21, no fault eviction. So it's just, oh, I need the property back for whatever reason. I'm selling it, or I want to do it at the house and it's not going to be habitable for you to stay in the property whilst I'm being. When they get served that eviction, they don't want to leave blood. I've met tenants who have told me two separate tenants. Now, obviously I've probably met other tenants that haven't, ex you know, told me why they've had to leave the property now, but I've had two tenants tell me that, yeah, the reason why they're living in a council house now is because the landlord, wanted the property back and they said no. And they had to get the bailiffs to evict them. And I just think to myself, there's no way these lot were still paying rent. Obviously, in the history of the world, there must have been some people who, you know, they were, the landlord wanted to evict them and they were saying no, but they were still keeping up with the rent. But more than likely, these tenants, if it takes for bailiffs to pull up at your door, more than likely, they probably stopped paying the rent. They probably said, you know what, fuck it. If you're kicking me out and I don't want to go, then I'm not paying rent. 
uh, this is what happens when you rent out the whole entire property. People get complacent and, you know, oh, I like my neighbours, I like the area, my kids go to that school over there, it's convenient for work. They don't want to move. They don't want to move because houses aren't that easily available for you to just get somewhere in the exact same area. Is it going to be as nice? Is it going to be as big? You know what I'm saying? So are the neighbours going to be crazy? And uh, people just don't want to leave. So that's why I choose to rent out my house uh, as a room share thing because people don't get complacent in the property. They don't feel like it's theirs. You can't feel like it's yours. You can't get too complacent and comfortable. You can't walk out of that shower. You get me? Yeah, put clothes on and that. You're always going to be seeing a strange face at some point or an unfamiliar face or a face that you're not comfortable with walking around. You understand what I'm trying to say? So. Renters rights. We will bring forward a renters reform bill in this parliament, abolishing no-fault evictions so tenants can have greater security in their homes. Excuse Close me? To what do you mean abolishing no-fault? Abolishing no-fault evictions so tenants can have greater security in their homes. So basically what you're saying is if someone takes on a house to rent, they can rent it and unless there's a fault with, with them, like they're damaging the house or they're not paying rent, they don't have to leave. This is what I'm saying. No, motherfucker, get the fuck out of the yard, blood. It's not your house. If you have a problem with landlords kicking you out, save your Ross Clark money and buy your old fucking property, blood. End of story. I don't, have, I don't worry about a landlord kicking me out. I've never had a landlord. The only landlord I've had is my mum. Yeah? I've never paid rent in my life. I've contributed to the household bills, giving my mum money. But I've never paid rent to a landlord. I don't even understand what that means, blood. Close to a quarter of private rented housing didn't meet the decent home standard, according to last year's English housing survey, meaning they were in disrepair, couldn't be heated or insulated, or could pose a risk to health. Currently, if tenants want to fix problems in their housing, they have to complain, firstly to their landlord and then to their local council. If that doesn't work, they can apply to a court, but that can be expensive and time consuming. Social housing tenants can have these problems investigated and resolved for free by a housing ombudsman, but it's up to private landlords whether they want to opt into that scheme. So the number of private landlords signed up is a drop in the ocean. We have just over 90 uh, private landlords who have uh, joined the scheme, and it's great that they have, but there's probably over 2 million. Uh, private landlords out there. So you've got... England's housing ombudsman says the government should legislate to give him powers over the private rented sector. I think it's very challenging to encourage landlords to volunteer to be part of an ombudsman scheme without making it mandatory. There are clearly some private landlords who have decided to join, but I think inevitably, unless you make it a statutory responsibility, you are not going to see uh, a, a significant number of private landlords becoming members of redress schemes. The Department for Leveling Up have told us they want to introduce a new ombudsman for the private rented sector, but some landlords are blaming the government for the problems renters are facing. I think the government has got to intervene by increasing the supply of rental properties because it's the lack of them that are pushing prices up. Vanessa Warwick runs landlord forum Property Tribes and says some of her members are worried about potential changes to the sector. Many, many landlords um, are concerned about Section 21 um, being, being abolished. Um, one thing that landlords need is, is to um, have certainty um, and, you know, to feel confident about investing because I feel that, you know, landlords do want to know that they can um, regain possession of their property if they need to. Yeah. The Meanwhile, fuck, like? tenants like Hayley are left to find a new place to call home. It's quite a desperate situation for people my age. But I, I you know, I'm, I'm still lucky. I'm still lucky. I'm so grateful for what I have, for having a roof over my head. It's special. It's magic. Uh, next video. Literally, I ain't seen none of these videos. This Christmas, it's really, really going to be difficult. It's like we've gone back and everybody's struggling. It's difficult because you ain't put in the fucking work. End of story. If you're broke right now, 
it is your fault. It's no one else's fault. You need to start taking accountability for your situation. Take accountability for the good things that happen in your life and take accountability for the bad things that happen in your life. The good things that's happened in your life is not by luck. You probably put in work and whatever. And the bad things that happen in your life is not being unlucky. You probably made bad decisions and that stupid decisions. So everyone needs to take accountability. This is what's wrong with the world. No one wants to admit that it's their fault. Because when a person admits that it's their fault, now they're in the mind frame of, okay, now I can fix it. But if you feel like it's not your fault, you're not going to be in the mind frame of thinking, I can fix it. Because you feel like it is, I don't know, something's fallen out of the sky and taken, taken over you or something like that. Or, you know, it's the government's fault why you're in this predicament, this situation. No, it's your fucking fault, blood. Win again. People are so desperate. A chat, a shoulder to cry on, were there for them. If you don't know what a warm bank is, it's basically almost like a homeless shelter for people that do have a home. So people that can't afford to heat up their houses and that, they can go to these community centres and sit in a place that's warm, basically. They're doing that across the country in libraries where people can go and sit in the library for free and keep warm. If you find yourself there, you know you've made some bad decisions in your life. Why the fuck can you not afford to heat your house? I'm not saying leave it on 24-7, but why can't you afford to heat your house for periods of the day in that? The first one, we only had two families, didn't we? And then now, there's 30 families today. <laughs> A welcoming space is somewhere that is happy, warm, a friendly face, a hot meal, where they know that they can come without any judgment, have a hot meal, a chat. As it gets colder, it's getting a lot busier. We just do what we can, really, because everybody needs an helping hand sometimes. We just slept. The hub itself would ostensibly set up for veterans to give them a warm, safe place to come and be with other like minded people. Uh, they're all as nutty as I am, so I don't feel like I'm. I'm that I'm, I'm any different from anyone else in here. You've got to be really thick skin, like. Sometimes it was the case where if it wasn't for somewhere like this to come, some of the veterans wouldn't leave the home. And there's always support for them there if one of them's feeling down, a chat, a shoulder to cry on, were there for them. All I'm seeing is low value mill, low value mill, low value mill, low value mill. Ain't no high value mill, ain't no mediocre. Well, maybe mediocre, but yeah, ain't no, I, I don't get into these terms and that in it, but I'm just using these terms, low value and high value, and that just so you can understand. If, as a man, you find yourself in this situation, you are a low value male, because you don't even have the pride to know and say, you know what, yeah, this is a shit situation to be in. I can't even show my face in this situation. You know what, I'm going to freeze my ass in this yard. You know, what? I'm going to put myself in an uncomfortable position so that I do something about it. These guys here, and these chicks as well, but these guys here are going to sit in this place, in this warm place and think, yeah, you know what, yeah, that's a little, uh, di not a distraction in that, but I'm able to bide my time in this place. No, fucking fix the situation, man. How are you 60 years old? Still struggling. What have you been doing over the last solid 30 years of your life? I get it. I'm not really saying I agree with it, but people fuck about in their 20s and that. But the age of 30 to 60 years old, what have you been doing for the last 30 years, blood? Seriously. You've been playing a fool's game, man. But man still got time to have pet dog, yeah? Today, uh, we've got a musical cafe. Uh, it's all run by volunteers. The volunteers sing live music or run the equipment for the karaoke. We have a lot of people who have learning difficulties come in and they, they really respond to the music and, and the space. It doesn't matter why people come, we just want them to come. <laughs> That's the main thing. In fact, this place is warmer than my own house at the minute, so um, I'm glad to be here as well. Heating's gonna go up, definitely. And 
and so is one food, so that might be a bit worrying, that one. It's like we've gone back an era. Yeah. Like, this will happening like years and years and years ago when we were young and everybody's struggling again. I do feel it's an absolute disgrace that in this day and age, people are frightened to put their heating on. So we wanted to like prepare to make sure... <laughs> the man there's asleep, you know. Fucking hell. People. You know you're doing something wrong when you're in the same environment as a lot of different people of different ages and that. You should be amongst people that are your age and that. Like, why are you in an environment like this? Imagine, yeah, you're sitting in a room full of fucking crackheads and that. Wouldn't you think you're doing something wrong? Yeah? I remember, you get me, I got myself in some little foolishness in it. End up in court not too long ago and I'm around people and like, these are just like crackheads and I remember I see like, you know like them trash people walking and that and like they were bringing their youths, like little babies and toddlers and that to court. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Women like they're having these loud conversations and that, like they know people, other people that are in there like, yeah, this is my, this is my oldest one, this is my youngest one. There's all a 20 year gap between them. I'm not saying anything about that, but I'm just saying I just remember the conversation and that and they're having loud conversations with people on the other side of the court in the waiting room and that. And I'm thinking like, blood. You should be ashamed of yourself, like, it's just dumb, man. No shame. But you should not be invited. You should be around people that are on the, should be on the same level as you. Like, why are you in environments like this? You will never find me in no place where, I mean, not voluntary anyway, around with no crackheads, blood, <laughs> yeah? Had somewhere to sit when they felt cold, save money on their energy, but also come together. I'm definitely going to be in no environments with people with green hair, with the black bomber club. As this group are doing, you know, come together. Because I think, you know, when you don't have a lot of money, it can be very isolating. If it wasn't for this place, then I would do it too. At 60 years old, you should have your feet up, no worries. Your biggest problem should be, fuck. Do I pay three grand to go to Jamaica for four weeks? Or do I pay three grand to go on a one week cruise? You understand what I'm trying to say? Look, these should be your problems when you're 60 years old. Not, I might turn into an icicle overnight and that. Come on, man. Purely, purely bangers. I probably would have stopped myself. And I've been close to it a few times. Apart from the people in here that have stopped us. I can't leave the house. Unless I would, yeah. If it's been like a godsend to me. I think he said something about committing suicide or something. Madness. She goes everywhere I go, but she's getting the whole mill. And I know she hasn't got that long much, like that long left. But I try and put that on my head. Yeah, he wants to cry, blood. Pussy. I think there's a lot more desperate people out there than ever before. Even with COVID and that, you know, people cope, didn't they? Their money and that. But now they're just, they're so desperate. And we do try and help. You know, if someone came in and said, could you help us with any food? We'll give them a bag of food to take home. You know, we'll never leave anyone desperate. I don't put my heating on. I can't afford it. And then it's just going up and up. So that's mainly why I come here. <laughs> At least we've got, like, the heater and everything. Well, last Christmas, so I've had family come had the heat on, we've had plenty to eat. But this Christmas, it's really, really going to be difficult. It's not just heating, it's presents as well. We used to spend quite a bit on with children, and now that we're finding we can't do that. You feel tight in that you're not as good because you can't afford it. I think it'll be a dire Christmas. I've got a little one, so what do you do? I mean, like. God provides, but where does that come from? And today was the first time I came on my own without any support. It was a big thing for us because I won't go anywhere on my own. Being there, I don't feel that I'm alone. I mean, I feel the vibrations. And... Hold on a minute. So it was a big thing for us because I won't go. Blood, is that tomato ketchup at the side of her mouth, blood? <laughs> what the fuck is that, blood? <laughs> oh. 
being there, I don't feel that I'm alone. I mean, I feel the vibrations, it doesn't matter what you sound like, you know, because everyone gets up and they enjoy it, it doesn't matter. You know, everyone sees the change in us. My family can see the change in us. I can feel my spirit lifting as well. You know, I love it, absolutely love it. Next video. Winter is five years old. Throughout her whole life, she's lived in temporary accommodation. Her mum, Yasmin, doesn't like to invite friends round because she says she's embarrassed by the state of the damp and mould. There's damp in nearly every single room, um, every room. When I moved in, the toilet was leaking into the back garden. There was tissue, faeces, everything all over the garden. Um, I cut oh, through man. the front door frame which is like rotted, it's right wood. There was fleas everywhere in all the carpets, jumping off the windowsills, biting my daughter, like in the bed. So Winter actually had bite marks oh, on Oh yeah, yeah, I've got pictures and stuff. She got bit all up her body from legs to top. The family previously spent months in hotels and hostels across Manchester. They were then offered this property until they can be rehoused permanently. As we're filming, we hear evidence of another problem. I can actually hear something. I bet it's rats. I bet it's mice and rats. Watch. I ain't seen this before. Yeah. It sounds like something's creeping it's around. It's stuck, I think. It's been there all day. I'm just really scared. I'm scared that it's just gonna... Can you hear it? I can hear the mouse. Oh, right. And it's not the first time Yasmin has caught a mouse. The council has to pay £800 a month to rent this property because it doesn't have enough social housing to accommodate everyone in the city who needs it. Yeah, so that, that is a little issue. In that. Like, even with my property, so obviously I've got this house and then two in this area, innit? but my first flat, um, yeah, the council sent me a letter saying, look, uh, we wouldn't mind taking your property off of you and renting it out to obviously council people and that um, because they need them. Now that's called, technically it's called private sector landlord. It's where a private landlord like myself or whoever, Mr. Joel Blogs that has 10 properties, the council, if they're aware of this person, they will approach them or uh, send them a letter or the landlord, the private landlord, myself or Joel Blogs that's got 10 properties, he can approach the council and say, listen, yeah, I'll give you my property, can you rent it out? One of my brothers is actually doing that at the moment. In Haringey Council, so I used to work for Homes of Haringey as an electrician. We used to have properties outside of Haringey. So there's times where I've been to Stamford Hill in Hackney. There's times where I've been to Wolverhampton. There's times, uh, oh, I think I heard about they had some properties up in uh, Cheson and that. These are outside the borough and that because private landlords will give their property to the council because they know it's guaranteed rent. They know they're always going to have their property um, uh, rented out and that. So, yeah, the councils, them are desperate for housing, basically. Isn't it? Winter and Jasmine aren't alone. New research by the charity Shelter, seen by Channel 4 News, shows that more than 230,000 people are registered as homeless in England. And that includes 123,000 children. With the pressure on social housing, temporary accommodation is anything but. The government told us that temporary accommodation is a last resort and that councils have been given 366. Now, why did they zoom in on the cigarettes? <laughs> I mean, what was the point of that? But anyway. Million pounds this year to prevent evictions. But the numbers are growing every day. At Manchester's civil court. Ah, that makes sense now. That fucking makes sense. The reason, remember that clip that we saw earlier where they were saying that the government are looking to introduce that new thing where you can't do a section 21, a non-fault eviction. So a non-fault eviction is you haven't done anything wrong, but I want the property back for whatever reason. I'm selling it, whatever, whatever. Well, not, not selling it, but I just want you out. I want to get some new people in for whatever reason. I reckon it's because when a landlord does a non-fault eviction, well, now the family is homeless. And I watched this program called Can't Pay, We'll Take It Away. And I've also watched Nightmare Tenant Slum Landlords. And when people get evicted by bailiffs, they get this, um, 
sort of letter from the bailiffs. And if they, t as long as they take that letter to the local council, whether it's Enfield, Harringay, Hackney, they can get emergency temporary accommodation. Now, obviously, over the last few years, they're getting uh, a high influx of people getting evicted for whatever reason, whether it's fault or non-fault and that. So in order to stop them getting evicted um, and coming to the, you know, the Hackney or Harringay or Enfield office or wherever in it, yeah, the emergency accommodation and that, they're actually going to introduce this new thing to stop that from happening. Think about it this way. If they do put that and make that a statutory law, you can't just evict people under Section 21 no more, non fault evictions in there. Imagine all the people who they haven't done anything wrong who have been evicted in that. That will slash the numbers down by probably 25%, 30%, maybe even all 50%. So that's probably why they're introducing that non fault eviction thing. Uh, they, well, they're, they're stopping it, should I say. Makes sense. We listened to dozens of cases in which Poor families sick, faced uh... losing their homes. So is it because of the cost of living crisis you feel that you're seeing more and more people? Absolutely. Kirsty Almond helps tenants in both social and private housing who are faced with eviction across Manchester and Merseyside. What I noticed in court was that there were people from all different backgrounds who were up for eviction because there's a perception that it's people on benefits in social housing, but that's not what we saw in court. No, not at all. We advise social tenants, uh, private tenants. We also advise those who are unable to keep up repayments with the mortgages. People are losing jobs um, and, and rents are increasing and, and people just simply can't afford to keep up with those rents. Um, so we're seeing more frequently that, that there isn't anything that we can do to keep people in the homes. The number of people living in temporary accommodation has sharply risen by 74% in the last 10 years. Oh my days. Maybe that's a coincidence. Yeah. Remember, I said 25, it'll probably, uh, if they introduce that thing where um, they uh, can't, can't give people Section 21 and that, you know, it will cut down the numbers by 25%, and it says 74%. But to be fair, actually, no, it's the. Anyway, forget it, man. Sure. And more than <laughs> two-thirds of those families have been there for over a year. In the short term, the government needs to unfreeze housing benefit. That's urgent. Um, but they also need to supply homes that people on low incomes can actually afford to rent. And by that, I mean... Why are you on a low income, blood? These are the questions that I need the answers to, fam. Social rent housing. What's the worst thing about being in temporary accommodation? Um, that you just have no, no freedom, no rights, and you're just a number. And I can't decorate. I can't have my own. No freedom, no rights. Blood, you're not a prisoner, you know. What do you mean, blood? This, this is your fault. I told you already. People them need to take accountability, fam. At some point in their life, they've made some critical mistakes. As a girl, she probably went to school, she probably went to college, didn't go to uni, then got pregnant. Blood, it's a downward spiral from there. Oh yeah, sorry, got knocked up by some waste man as well. Yeah, <laughs> can't forget that part. Can't forget that part. Take accountability. These people actually, this is, this is why, this, some people will never be able to progress in their life because they don't even understand where they went wrong. I made a video talking about we need to review our timeline and understand where we went wrong. A lot of people don't understand it's because, oh, you know, they dropped out of college and then they just decided to, or they didn't even, or they dropped out of a course. They didn't finish this course. They went on to that course. Then they didn't finish that one. Then they fucked about and then they ended up dropping out. Then they thought, oh, you know, let me just go work for Sky or... Virgin Media or fucking was it Auto Glass and then place it just dumb jobs. You need a fucking career, fam. You don't want just a job. You want to get yourself in a career where you can progress. Stop working these bullshit jobs that uh, means that they don't end nowhere. Personality. I have to keep boxes all over the house just in case we have to move tomorrow. The council might nah, no way they're just going to make you move the next day. Come on, man. I might say to you that, you know, at least you're not in a hotel now. You've got a house. You're luckier than a lot of people. Yeah. I'll just wait in my turn, basically. 
and you've got no idea when that turn will come? No. Nope. Manchester City Council told us they're very concerned that Yasmin has had such an unsatisfactory experience. But it was her turn to jump in bed though. And they're working to resolve the issues as soon as possible. They said there's a national issue with the quality of private rented accommodation and considerable pressure locally on temporary provision. What are your hopes now for yourself and for your daughter, Winter? Um, to get out of here as fast as possible. It's looking as though she is going to grow up in temporary accommodation unless the council want to change something, maybe build more houses. I don't no, unless you want to change something. That's what I'm saying. These people are relying on higher powers. Now, this is no a supernatural, godly conversation. Yeah, They're relying on the council, the government, their mum, their dad, instead of trying to fix their situation themselves. Unless the council. Why are you relying on someone else, blood? The fuck, man? God forbid I start relying on the government or the council to fix my situation. I'll make a live stream and castrate my fucking self, blood. Oh, Piss me oh, off. It's going to be a long time. She's going to be nearly grown up. Darsh Nasani reporting there. Well, earlier I spoke to Lord Bob Kerslake, the former head of the civil service who used to run the communities and local government department. He now chairs the Kerslake Commission on Homelessness and Rough Sleeping. I began by asking him for his reaction to the scale of homelessness in England. Well, it's a shocking figure, but I'm afraid not surprising. Uh, this has been building for a number of years. And whilst the government have taken uh, measures to address some of the uh, most acute issues on homelessness, particularly rough sleeping, I'm afraid uh, the core problem we have in this country we're not, is that we're not building enough genuinely affordable homes. I mean, that is the fundamental problem. That has been a problem in successive governments of, of different political hues. Most recently, uh, housing targets, which councils were supposed to observe, were watered down after a, a rebellion by Conservative MPs. So how do political parties get round this kind of nimbyism? How do they address that? Well, it's a good question. And it's not just that we need to build more homes. We specifically need to build more homes that are genuinely affordable for rent, because really those are the houses that people who are at risk of becoming homeless need to go into. And the problem, I'm afraid, has been exacerbated by the rising uh, cost of living and the rising level of rents. In London, they're soaring. Uh, and I'm afraid the housing allowance, the so-called local housing allowance, that sets the level of benefits just hasn't kept pace. So you're finding, if you like, more people coming into homelessness and fewer opportunities to house them. I mean, the government has said it's, it's given these cost of living payments as a two billion pound household support fund. It sounds like a lot of money. Um, is it Welcome to the fucking real world. Like, I'm telling you, we got it so good in England, you lot don't even understand. Do you think they have all of this in Africa or Jamaica or fucking, let's say for the white people there, eastern parts of Europe and that? No. You see countries like Romania and that. And like Poland and that, like 80% of the properties are privately owned. Do you know why? Because people have to build their property or be fucking homeless or buy, obviously, innit? Yeah? We got it too easy over here. That's why Brits are so fucking lazy. I told you a lot many times and I tell you fucking again, blood. I remember working at that infamous Holden job, the best job I've ever had. Maybe this job I'm at now is, but yeah, that was one of the best, the best job I probably ever had in my life, innit? And I remember. I was working there every day for four and a half months straight, took one day off uh, because I had to, I had to take an exam. Lost out on £400 that, that Sunday, I was vexed, blood, imagine, man just going into work, sitting down, chatting and chatting shit and getting paid £400, minding my tea, you get me? So anyway, um, yeah, I remember jumping on the, the, the train on a Saturday and a Sunday. And I'm walking through the carriage and there's white people, there's Asian people and that, but, and black people. But none of them are British born. I could just look at them and tell, I know they're foreigners, isn't it? The white people, them are Eastern European. The Asian people, them are from India, Bangladesh, from there. 
and the black people there are African. All foreigners. I was the only British-born person on the train. I remember I observed this one time and I just thought to myself, English British people are fucking lazy. When I say British people, I mean people are just born in Britain. So irrespective of skin colour and that. They're fucking lazy. God forbid you told a British person you need to work on a Saturday and a Sunday. They'll fucking have a heart attack. Man will go into a slide, slip into depression, blood. This is not the 1940s where people don't work Saturday and Sunday. Now, you need to be working six, seven days a week, innit? Now, I'm not saying do that until the end of time and, and obviously fucking drop dead. What I'm saying is, that, what, what's, what's the problem with, I don't know, one in three weeks you have to work Saturday and Sunday? You, you, your, your weekends are that important to you? Most people are just sitting around doing fuck all anyway on the weekend, man. Work, earn some money. Put yourself in a position where you can't ever spend no money. Just dumb. British people are fucking lazy, man. And then they wonder why Eastern European people come over here and take their jobs and that. You're not willing to work. You're not willing to put in the hours. And you feel like you need to be paid more than what your job's really worth. So then that allows the Eastern European man to come in and undercut the market. you got electricians charging fucking £60 pound to... to to um, change your fucking light switch and that. Eastern European man will come and do that for £30. Oh, my time is so precious and that. But your time ain't precious, but you're an idiot, blood. These, these, these jobs that we do, electrician and all these jobs, I don't, I don't rate being an electrician, you know. I don't rate being an electrician. It's a good job, it pays well, and that, but I don't rate it. Back, all, back in like Eastern Europe and like Africa, and that, you think they respect electricians and tradespeople? Come on, man. Only in England, only in Britain are uh, being, is being a tradesman fucking celebrated and that. It's fucking ridiculous. Man will put more, man will put the same respect on an electrician's name than a fucking, as, a, as opposed to a lawyer. So man will regard an electrician as being on the same level as a lawyer. What, just because they get paid the same? It's not about, it's not all about the pay. It's about the hard work that it took to get to that position. Told you already. Them white boy there that man used to be in, in class with, and that, them, them boy there that throw paper at people's head, ADHD, and that, these are the men that have become electricians. Them youths there that become lawyers and, that, and doctors, and they weren't throwing papers at nobody's head. They ain't got no fucking ADHD, blood. They're not, in your view. Well, I'm afraid it's not matching the scale of the challenge. That's the problem. Uh, and uh, if you talk to any local authority, if you talk to any organisation working in the homelessness sector, they will give you the same story that uh, after a period where we've seen rough sleeping, particularly for and homelessness for, uh, it's starting to rise again. Uh, I think the guy man is sleeping rough, but it's always a beer can beside their makeshift bed. Funny that, isn't it? Government need to just wake up to the scale of the problem. I think also, by the way, we're going to have to look at some different ways of getting more genuinely affordable homes available for those in temporary accommodation more quickly. It's just worth saying that the, this is the worst of all worlds, you know, the cost of temporary accommodation is huge and the experience of those who are in it is terrible, um, absolutely terrible in many, many occasions. So we have to see the scale of the problem and do something about it. There is a renters reform bill on the books which should be, should uh, make legislation later this year. Um, how urgent is that, particularly in the context of evictions on the rise, and it would end no-fault evictions, that bill? We urgently need to get on with the Renters' Reform Bill, which will give greater protections to those in rented accommodation. But we will still have the problem that rents are rising uh, way ahead of people's ability to pay and for them to fund it through benefits when they need to. So it will help, undoubtedly, but it won't be a complete answer to the issue. And it certainly won't address our desperate need to get more genuinely affordable homes for rent being built. What are the repercussions if this government fails to act or if the next government could be a Labour government fails to build enough houses once again? I think it's soaring costs of temporary accommodation. Uh, and it's more human misery and more anxiety and uncertainty uh, to people. So it's a lose-lose situation here. Government loses out because it has to foot the bill uh, and those involved lose out as well. Uh, it really is essential that we have a much stronger programme of building generally affordable homes and action now really 
to avoid people going into homelessness, more action. Lord Kerslake, thanks very much. Thank you. Hopefully one day I'll become a Lord. Lord Knight! Come on. Ah, oh, this might be the video with the... All the money I'd saved up has gone, and I went back to sex work because I had to support my daughter. Yeah, that's... <laughs> You know, listen to that backstory there, bro. You know things is bad, you know. The woman couldn't even afford to build up the OnlyFans account, yeah? She had to put her blood clot on the street. All the money I'd saved up has gone, and I went back to sex work because I had to support my daughter. I can't afford to cover my rent, and the cost of living is going up. Whether it's stripping, street work, OnlyFans, online or in person, sex work in Britain is booming. But at what price? There is no doubt in my mind that people are doing more riskier forms of sex work to get by. Women have told us they're returning to work in brothels and taking on potentially more dangerous clients just to pay their spiralling bills. The women that we hear from every single day are being pushed into sex work because of poverty. If we had money in our hands, I wouldn't be in this situation to start with. Mad, these girls are opening up, spreading their legs just to put corn beef on the table, blood. Are you mad? Fucking hell, blood. I say, you know times are hard, boy. I do my best to protect my daughter, and this is just all really for her. The world of sex work can be precarious. Stacey Clare, aka the ethical stripper, wants to take stripping out of the shadows and into a space where she and other workers set their terms. Life drawing classes run by and to support sex workers. Stacy is tonight's model. East London strippers. Let's see if there's an address. One sec. Where she and other workers set their terms. Life drawing classes run by and to support. Oh, what's all that? Their terms. Life drawing. Well, what's all that red? Is it the time of the month or something? Classes, Fuck, run blood. by and to support. Oh, clean sex yourself workers. up, man. Why Stacey is tonight's model. But like so many, the cost of living crisis is never far from her mind. History teaches us that when we see economic downturn, the most vulnerable people in society are closer to harm. I, I was chatting to a man the other day and I was saying, you know what? Because I've never been to a strip club. I've never been to a brothel. I've never touched a fucking prostitute. Like, it's all neaky in it. I don't, I don't rate that in it. But I've never been to a strip club ever in my life. I never will. Um, it's one of the neakiest things to be going to a, a strip club and peeling off 50s, 20s, 10s and that. And you're throwing money at women. Women don't do that for men. Why the fuck are men doing that for gal blood? It's sneaky, blood. Why are you giving women money? Do you think I've ever given a girl money before in my life, blood? Obviously, I've said, yeah, take this £10, go buy this. Or obviously, you understand what I'm trying to say, innit? Yeah, let's not get stupid to think that I've never given a girl a pound or £10 or whatever, innit? But what I'm saying is, man's never, oh, here, yeah, just take that and spend whatever you... No. If I've never done that, you think I'm going to go to a strip club and be throwing my hard-earned money at a girl? You must be going nuts, bro. but that's the, one of the neakiest things you can do. Pay, throwing money at... Fam, is this a club full of people that are neeks, neeks and don't have no self-respect? The girl them have no self-respect, dancing half-naked, pubic hair all out and that. And then a the man them are neeks because they're throwing money at the, these women and that. It's just dumb, bro. You think I'll ever find myself in a strip club getting a lap dance? Worry about my community. I got a girl. If, if I need a lap dance, I thought, yo. I worry listen. about the people that I, I've come to know and be close to, um, and I know that you know a lot of people in our community are really living in quite precarious circumstances. And one of the things we've we've been told is that sex workers are being put in much riskier situations because of the cost of living. Crisis. There is no doubt in my mind that people are doing more riskier forms of sex work to get by. We did a party recently, private location, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, some of us especially drove out into the countryside. I wonder how old she is. She looks like she's in her 40s, you know, but I guarantee you she's probably only about 32, 35 at best. And luckily enough, you know, it went well. But if anything had gone wrong, 
While Stacy accepts she's in a more privileged position than most in her industry, there are many who are just about surviving. Take single mum Janelle, not her real name. When her energy bills more than doubled, it all became too much. Having left years ago, she has recently returned to sex work. My bills started skyrocketing. I had to move out of my flat and find somewhere cheaper. I just feel like my whole life has turned upside down due to the conditions I'm working in now. Do you find you're taking riskier jobs and, and it's more dangerous because you need the money? Before, I could think about my safety and whether I should take that client or not. But now, I don't really have much of a choice. I work longer hours just to make the same amount of money. And I... You have to think to yourself, like this thing is dangerous, meeting up with clients. Like being in a strip club, I mean, I don't think that's dangerous because there's witnesses and shit like that and it's all. But these women that are meeting up with clients and that being prostitutes, selling themselves and that, you're dealing with men who are desperate. Desperate people are the dangerous motherfuckers on this planet, you know? Desperate people, if a man is hungry enough, he will kill you over a sandwich, you know? If a man is desperate enough, a man will snake you for your gal, you know? If a man is desperate enough, a man will rob you, you know? So if a man is desperate enough, a certain man feel like, no, why should I need to pay for this? I'm a man, so I should get this for free and that. Madness. You're dealing with desperate people, isn't it? Yeah? So there's, there's always a danger and a threat when you're dealing with desperate people. I'd rather do business with a rich, wealthy person than a fucking crackhead or a man that works minimum wage. Like, who are you going to trust more? Would you trust leaving £10,000 with Alan Sugar, you don't know who he is, or some local fucking tramp that you don't know? I'd rather leave £10,000 with a wealthy, or you don't even have to be Alan Sugar, someone that you know, like, okay, for some reason you just know that this person is wealthy enough. I'd rather leave £10,000 with this rich, wealthy person than fucking some random guy off the street who's working minimum wage and that. I never spend anything on myself, like clothes. My only expenses are my daughter, food, housing. I have to be so careful. Condoms. My daughter was asking me for a happy meal the other day and then I had to pause and check my bank account to see if I could afford it today or if I should wait till tomorrow. I have never, ever in my life need, wanted to buy something and thought, can I afford this? No. For one, I always know how much money I've got, really. And I've got so much money, I, nah, I ain't rich, you know what I'm saying? I've got so much money that I don't even need to check to see if I can afford this or not. It's whether I think it's worth it or not. That's the sort of position you want to be in. You don't want to be thinking, can I afford this? You want to be thinking, is this worth it? I've never gone to buy something or thought about buying something. Hey, let me check my bank balance first. No fucking way. Absolutely not. Hi, yes. How can I help? From housing to heating, in the last few months, the English collective of prostitutes, which support sex workers, say they've received hundreds of calls from women asking for help. Most of the women we're seeing are mothers. I mean, that has to say something about what's happening out there. You know, why people are being pushed into sex. Well, of course they're going to be mothers. Most prostitutes are going to be over the age of 21, 25, 30 years old. And most women over the age of 21, 25, 30 years old are going to be mums. Like, it's just, just, come on, man. It's dumb. That's like saying most men in the army are fathers and that. Well, most men who are, a lot of men who are 21, 25, 30 years old are going to have kids. Let's work at this. Like, what demographic of women did you think would be prostitutes and be uh, childless? Like, come on, man. It's just dumb. Moment in time because the other jobs that you can do don't pay enough to make ends meet. We get women calling asking for food vouchers or whether we can help them find their nearest food bank. They're worried about the high energy bills. They're worried about the cost of transportation. A lot of women calling about housing issues. Well, you've, you've touched on this. Obviously, there are a number of grey areas when it comes to sex work. You know, some of it's legal, some of it's illegal. Even though it's not illegal to exchange sex for money, if you work in a premises with just even one other woman, you're actually breaking the law and you can be done for brothel keeping. What we're asking for is particularly at this moment in time in a cost of living crisis, decriminalise sex work. Women shouldn't be punished for earning a living, for supporting their families. There will be people who say that if you make sex work legal, 
then essentially you're you're kind of legitimizing and giving free reign to pimps and traffickers. You're saying, this is okay, we're on your side. What, what's your take on that? New Zealand decriminalised. They decriminalised way back in 2003 and all the evidence shows that it's actually made it safer for sex workers. As the cold weather bites, we're in Leeds where the Basis Sex Worker Project has been set up to support cis and trans women working on the streets. Here, donated clothes are being dropped off for sex workers. We are really worried about women that don't see themselves as sex workers but are turning to... I mean, I ain't pulling up on no prostitute wearing those fucking jeans, blood. Yeah? The fuck? Man, if I'm pulling up on a prosy, blood, you better be wearing something better than that. Sex workers. The fuck, really blood? Some Bob the Builder Peacock's blue denim jeans, blood. Are you mad? Worried about women that don't see themselves as sex workers but are turning to survival sex for want of a better phrase. Survival sex, you know. Going back to basics, literally. What can I sell my body? And are being asked to do sexual services. Uh, for money in exchange for money without knowing that there's a service out there that can help them um, and then they're being sexually exploited. When approached by Channel 4 News, a government spokesperson said it was providing an extensive cost of living package for families this week. No one is asking them to do sexual... Obviously, there's always the little 1%, but forget about that, yeah. No one is asking them to perform sexual uh, acts and that. They are putting themselves out there. They stand on it. Come on, man. Let's see, this is the thing. They're not taking accountability. Oh, well, you know, I just got into prostitution because I, I just happened to be asked by this guy and I thought it was a good idea and I just went along with it. No, you put yourself out there, man. Winter, adding that they were committed to protecting those selling sex from harm, enabling the police to target those who they said exploit vulnerable people. While rising bills and living in poverty is no secret, being a sex worker for some has to be. I'll never tell any of my family or friends what I do. They think I'm a cleaner. Essentially, I, I do my best to protect my daughter. She be out here polishing the crown jewels, baby. And this is just all really for her. The more people can start to see sex workers as human beings with complex lives, with relationships, with kids and families and, you know, homes and responsibilities and commitments. It's, any, it's like anyone else, you know, we're, we're not that different. That's mad, you know. So, I mean, any of us watching this right now, whatever, in it, yeah, probably don't know anyone. But you never know. You could. There are people out here who just think, oh, that person just whatever they're clean or whatever. They are actually a sex worker. Now, the reason why they'll use the job as a cleaner is because they have no fixed place of work. Remember, if you're a cleaner, you're going to be all about the place and that. So it's not like. You know, you know what I'm trying to say in it, like, if you knew your friend was an office worker, or your friend told you they're, they're an office worker, that could be sort of disproved and that. It was like, well, if you're an office worker, why are you always in different locations and that? Whereas if you're a cleaner, you know what I'm saying, you're always on the move, you're always out and about and that in different locations and that. So that's why they say, that's why she says she's a cleaner. That's mad, but literally, some of us might know someone who, you know, sells their body on the side, and it's been doing it for a little while, you know, but they just keep it stum. It's nuts. But that's it for today. Madness. Can't believe people are actually spreading them legs just to keep the heating on. Nuts, man. Stay where it's done, though.